All right. All right. Well, I've been just praying about um, where the Lord would lead us, and just since we finished Second Timothy um, a couple weeks ago, I just was praying about what book to start next, and was just feeling like um, this would be a great opportunity just to teach on some Bible prophecy, some things that the Lord, I believe, has been putting on my heart, and and just been praying, and to see for the next few weeks just to do this. Um, and the Lord kind of brought me to, to Revelation chapter 2 um, this evening. Um, so let's begin there. All right, Revelation chapter 2. I'm going to begin in verse 8. It says, To the angel of the church of Smyrna, right? These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich. I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a, a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. And so, here we have the church of Smyrna. And we've studied this before. It's been a while. But Smyrna means bitter. It's Smyrna is related to myrrh. You know, in the Bible, we, we know myrrh um, was, it was used to embalm. It was, it, you know, it was it embalmed the bodies. It was, it was bitter, actually, a bitter herb um, um, fragrance. And once it was crushed, it, it gave off this sweet aroma. And <clears throat> um, so you would crush it, and it would give this, this wonderful fragrance. And, and so... You know, we have to ask ourselves, that's Smyrna, myrrh. How, you know, what does this mean for this church in Smyrna? And I think um, it, it means, of course, we've studied this before, it means this was the suffering church, this was the persecuted church. And it was crushed. But once it was crushed, what happened? It produced a beautiful fragrance. And so I wanted us to talk about that tonight. You know, Jesus is speaking here in Revelation and he gets directly to the point here about that they're suffering. This church was suffering. And he's saying, hey, it's even going to get worse. Right? And, and, and there's, um, you know, there was enemies that were coming against this church that was thriving. You know, it was, they, 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 they were vicious. Again, as it says, um, I know your works, I know your tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. Um, I was on a pastor's meeting yesterday with some uh, Calvary pastors, um, senior pastors, and um, we had a meeting, and we were just kind of talking about how things were going in our churches, and, and so it was, there was maybe about eight of us from you know, Bellingham down to Longview, um, maybe eight to ten of us. And so we were just kind of sharing how some things were going. And one of the Calvary chapels um, in Kent um, said that they received a, 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 a citation in the, in, by, via email, um, I think from the health department, just saying that they were in violation and that list all the things they were in violation of. And it didn't say who reported them, but... It was basically assumed that it was someone from within the church, you know, someone that came to church, you know, reported them because, there, you know, there was no evidence, right? It was just say someone said this about you, that, they, that you weren't social distancing or mass or whatever the thing was, right? Or you're worshiping, you're not supposed to do that. Um, and so it's just kind of, it was alarming, you know, it kind of, it kind of, for me, it, it was like, wow, that's interesting. We, I asked, I asked specifically what, what, um, what 
the ramifications were, what he was going to do differently, and he had said that he wasn't going to do anything differently, but that the the warning and the thing was that they're not going to do anything right now, but if they get another flag or whatever, or someone else complains, then, then they'll come visit the place or something like that. But then uh, the, the pastor, Al Fredericks in Calvary Chapel Longview, he was sharing that... Um, that another church reported them, turned them in. Another church complained because they weren't meeting, <laughs> and they complained about the Calvary Chapel meeting. <laughs> and so the, another church reported the Calvary Chapel in Longview, and so they got, also got a, some kind of citation. And <clears throat> I guess, you know, it's funny because I had already picked the text here, but I thought, gosh, these are the, the very things that we're seeing in our day, you know? And it's, um, it's sad, you know? And we're, I mean, and we're hearing things, you know? They're, they're, they're starting to label um, conservative Christians as a terrorist group. <laughs> I, mean, you know, they're, I mean, people in high government, and they're coming against us. And, and I think on some level, we just, we have to be aware of it. We have to have faith and just trust the Lord, of course. But um, also, um, we, you know, we have to be prepared. So, um, you know, to follow Christ in, in a deep level, um, to, to, you know, it, it can be dangerous sometimes. You know, that's what the, the church in Smyrna is here. They were, they, were, they were facing dangerous situations, being thrown in prison or, or even death, as it says. And um, they say... Um, in 195 BC, Rome had dedicated um, the goddess, goddess of Rome in Smyrna. So there was some kind of goddess dedication there in this city. And basically, they wanted everybody to worship this, this, you know, this statue or whatever it was. And, and if you were to worship this statue, you would have favor with Rome. And, and so those who objected were persecuted. And of course, naturally, the Christians refused. Naturally, the, the true born-again believers there in Smyrna, you know, they, they refused to worship the statue. And, and, of course, that's when the tensions mounted. And so, just as we take this text this morning as our backdrop, I, I, I think that what I wanted to talk to us about is, you know, why does the church have to suffer? You know, why does the true church have to suffer specifically with persecution? And I think the first thing that I thought about was discipline. I mean, sometimes we go through difficult seasons, we go through difficult times because we need correcting. And that can be a good thing, you know. Um, we're, we're, we're going down a wrong road, and the Lord is so faithful, he, he, and, you know, he does something to get our attention. And aren't you thankful for that, when he does that? Hebrew, if you're taking notes, Hebrews 12, 11, says this. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful in the present, but painful, but nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. We don't like those times, kinds of tough times, though, do we? But they're designed to kind of get us on back track with the Lord, and that's a good thing. It's a good thing. You know, the second thing is preventative. Sometimes God allows difficult things in our life to keep us from, from going down that bad path in the first place. And so he sees our tendency to do wrong things, and he's trying to keep us from going the wrong way. You know, Paul, I was thinking about him. We've been studying the book of Acts, and, you know, Paul could have been an extremely obnoxious person because, very proud person because how much he knew. But the Lord humbled his heart and put him on that right path. The Lord literally prevented Paul from going down that path, right, and humbled him. I think sometimes we go through these difficult times for growth. You know, it's, isn't it true? When we go through the, the hard times, that's when we grow the most spiritually. Um, when we face the greatest difficulty. You know, Paul wrote this, if you're taking notes, Romans 5, 3, he says, And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. And perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts 
by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And so sometimes God allows the difficulty in our, in our lives to help us grow. And that's good, isn't it? Great illustration is a butterfly. You know, a butterfly has to work really hard to get out of its cocoon. And it, it has to struggle. And, you know, if you had pity on it and cut the, you know, cocoon open, it, would, it wouldn't be able to grow. It wouldn't be able to ha- have developed into that butterfly. It would have sp- still been a, a, a caterpillar right? And yet as it struggles, um, it, 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 it formed and, 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 and it turns into this beautiful butterfly. And that's kind of the, the same thing. You know, testing. Sometimes the Lord allows difficulty to come for this, the very purpose of testing us. See if we're faithful. You know, to see where we're at. How, can, how do we handle those difficult times? How do we handle these these difficult situations are we faithful. It's a test. Isn't that true sometimes? It's a test in our life. But again, fragrance. I like that. You know, Smyrna, myrrh. You know, the, the, this, this city, this was all about. And, and um, when we also choose to endure sufferings for the sake of being a Christian, even in perilous times, um, that sacrifice brings a pleasant aroma before the Lord in our lives. Um, remember when Mary broke the, the, the perfume and, and put it over Jesus' head and, and feet? And, and, and in, in John 12, it tells us the, the whole house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. And I can't help but think everyone around her was affected. Everybody could smell it. Everybody knew what she did. And, and the same is true for us is, you know, everyone around us is affected, uh, affected by sometimes the suffering they see in a Christian's life and if it's done correctly. You know, the coronavirus, um, this season, it's been a difficult time. Anybody else, it's been difficult? You know, it's been challenging, I think. I certainly... There's been decisions that I've had to make as a pastor that I never thought I would have, ever have to make, to be honest. I never thought I'd have to be making these, these decisions. And, and, you know, not everybody is happy with the decisions I make, and that's hard sometimes, you know? And yet, it's also been one of the most fruitful times I've ever seen. It's been one of the most wonderful times, to be honest. And it's not just people Right? I mean, people have been coming and, and, and hearing the word. Um, people have been coming to Christ. Um, people have been blessed by this church. And as, we have, as we've been able to minister to people and, and help people out and, 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 and share with them. And that is amazing, isn't it? And I, I, see, I see God working in all of this. And we can't ever forget that. If you're in still Revelation chapter 2, look at verse 9. Again, it says, I know your works, your tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. You are rich. It's interesting. They didn't struggle because they had weak faith. They didn't struggle because they didn't, you know, love God enough. They struggled for them. It was part of God's plan. And I know that's not a popular notion, but here's what we need to know, is that when you risk everything for Christ, when you sacrifice for Christ, he says, you're rich. You're rich. And we have to always remember that. You know, you may miss out on some of the world's things that they have to offer. You may never live in the best neighborhood or, you, you know, there may be even difficult times for you. You might have to go without something, maybe something, some of the necessities. You have to give up something. And yet, do you know that many, if many Christians in this world, many Christians suffer from extreme poverty. Many Christians around our world. And we forget that, don't we? Maybe we don't forget it, but it's, it's, it's kind of far away. And, you know, 
there's many Christians, they never get to park a car in a garage or, or you know, have a savings account. I mean, sometimes I have to think about that. They're, they're, the main thing is they're worried about how to feed their families at night, you know? But you know what? If they're submitted to God, if, even though they have nothing, I believe they're part of his plan and they're rich. That's what we have to remember. They're rich in Christ. And we have to remember that too when things are going difficult and, and we go through different seasons and stuff that if we sacrifice for Christ, if we live for him, we also are rich. You know, the people making sacrifices grow closer to Jesus. That's just the truth, right? The people, they get to be used by him. Um, and, you know, listen, people who don't make sacrifices, who, who aren't taking steps of faith, they will never experience that, what it's like. They'll never experience that with the Lord. And so, guys, listen, we don't like doing without, do we? We don't. It's just, it's just of course not. But you know what? I just, I just believe this. Every single person who's ministered to someone, every single person who has shared the truth, the gospel, who has loved someone, who has encouraged someone, has been richly blessed. Isn't it true? God blesses us. That's the result as we step out in faith. He blesses us. He, he, we are rich. When we're used by God. Now, I don't think that, the, listen, I don't think the Smyrna Christians are complaining one bit as they look at, in awe of the rewards that the Lord gave, is giving them in heaven. They are not complaining one bit. It says they were slandered. I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. You know, it, you know um, every, I think every person who truly walks by faith will at one point have someone lie about them, truly. But, you know, I think we have to think about this for a second because before we speak ill about a person, before we listen to gossip, we have to take a very hard look at what Jesus says here about these people. He says they're attending the church of Satan, basically, is that is what they're saying. You know, you, but you're the synagogue of Satan. You know, they, they had caused problems. And, you know, the devil is the father of lies. But isn't it comforting that Jesus knows that those people lied? He, he knows it. And he knows that, you know, who's lying and who's not. But it gets worse. Verse 10. <laughs> Do not fear any of these things which are about to which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested that we see it and you will have tribulation 10 days. How would you feel if Jesus told you don't be afraid or about to what you're about to suffer? <laughs> I would probably start running the other way, wouldn't you? <laughs> but, you know, God knew they were sincere in their faith. And, and they needed to know it too, though. You know, I, I, do you ever ask yourselves this? Could I stand this kind of faith? Could I stand this kind of test? You know, if, if the Lord himself were to say this to me. And I, I believe as the, as the Lord um, return nears, we are going to face more problems I just, I see it. You know, I, I don't know about jail, I, fines. I, I mean, just for teaching the Bible, just for living out our faith. I think we're going to be facing more and more problems. And, you know, I would have never said that last year. I mean, I would have said it, but I wouldn't have necessarily believed it. Yeah, we're going to face problems, you know. It, it, but it's, we're seeing it right now. So, but you know what? The, the, this verse, this scripture ends very encouraging. It says, be faithful. The end of verse 10. Be faithful until death, and I'll give you the crown of life. This was the martyred church. You know, I believe, as Calvary Chapel's in a whole, 
they're, they're built upon the foundation of these first two churches that we read about in Revelation, uh, Ephesus and Smyrna. You know, Ephesus was essentially apostle, the apostolic church. They were founded on the, the apostles' doctrine, the word of God. And, and then we see the church in Smyrna, you know, and, and the persecuted church. And I think about, for just a minute, of all the people who have gone before us. And I just think, thankful. Aren't you thankful for all the, all the Christians who have gone before us, who have lived out their faith? You know, they, they, all the Calvary Chapel guys, who have, Pastor Chuck, and, you know, but even going back farther, you know, just the, the, the people who have, you know, lived for Jesus until the end. Man, that's awesome. Um, they suffered. Some died. But they were fruitful. And Jesus tells us, as a church today, he says, I want you to remain faithful until the end, no matter what. Just remain faithful to the end. And I believe, is why I wanted to share this tonight, is this, I think that on some level we have to prepare ourselves for that. Now, do, do I know what kind of extent that's going to happen? I don't. You know, maybe, maybe it's not going to be that big a deal. Maybe it's a bigger deal than we think. Um, but you know, we, I guess, you know, we're, I'm going to show this message in just a second if you guys want to get ready. But, guys, we can't go along with the world. We have to remain faithful as Christians. And Lisa and I, we want, someone sent this to us. Pastor Ken Ortiz out of Calvary Temple, Spokane. He, um, he, he's been doing kind of a message, some messages on what the world's coming to. And I just... I just, this one last part, this is kind of the end of his message. It's about 20 minutes long, and it's only 7.30, so we got time. But um, he, he talks about these aspects of brainwashing. And I was, I was just, re- I thought he did a good job of just kind of walking us through this. And so I thought, I wanted to show this tonight because as, as Christians, we have to be different from the world. And so, and I think this kind of goes along with what we're, we've been reading tonight. So, we'll play this and I'll pray, come up and pray. Back and say, how could such a thing happen? How do you sell this idea to Main Street to people like you and me? Well, <clears throat> as I said, next week I want to get into the economic dynamics because dynamics, that's the one that concerns most people. But... The CIA came up with an interesting term after the Korean War. They called it brainwashing. The term basically means to make someone adopt radically different beliefs by using systematic and forcible pressure. By keeping pressure on systematically, repeatedly, over and over again, you keep on hearing the same things being said over and over again, the same dynamics being used. And there are basically eight things that are common to brainwashing a person. The first one is fear. They begin by exaggerating the novelty of our situation. The novel coronavirus. As if, what's novel? It's a coronavirus. It's the 19th in a chain. And they're already talking about 24 and 25. So don't throw your masks away too quickly. And even with that, we're going to have to probably... We have 356 uh, environmental organizations who are lobbying the, the uh, Biden administration to extend a year-long lockdown of the United States so that we can drive down carbon emissions because they saw a slight dip last year. Now, you may sit and say, well, that's not going to happen. Yeah, but I, I would have said that about Joe Biden becoming president. <laughs> Or even Donald Trump. (laughs) They begin to tell us that we're in fear of dying. In fact, I was reading uh, recommendations from the CDC about uh, keeping yourself safe on the airplane. And one of the things that really struck me was particularly useful. They said, do not wear shorts when you're flying. I thought, okay, so I had to read that. And it said, because your knees can rub up against the seat in front of you, which could have the virus on it, and the next time, you're licking your knees. You know what I mean? It's like, I thought, 
seriously? <laughs> I mean, it, 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 went, it went down from there. It was like, it, what is the effect of something like that? If you take that seriously, you close the shades, you lock the door, and you call Walmart to have them deliver your bro groceries. And you create, as many of the wealthy are doing now, a what they call an Amazon room in their house so that somebody can come in and they can put the stuff in the Amazon room without coming in contact with you. And then you can go in and sterilize everything before you open up your Cracker Jacks. Now think about that. <laughs> if you take it seriously, if you, the, the limits to which they will ask you to go become ridiculous. So that we find now that people who are wearing two masks look down judgingly towards those of us who have one and they want to kill those of us who have none. Next we know the guy with three masks will be looking at the guy with two masks and criticizing him for not being masked up sufficiently. But you see, think about what we've done and what we're still living under. Churches are closed or else they're being told how they can worship. You cannot sing. You cannot touch. I mean, I mean, some of the crazy things that people do, because I've heard of churches where they actually serve meals and, and uh, <laughs> you know, aren't, aren't social distancing. But the whole idea is that fear makes us very compliant. And I would just simply say, if you're one of those people out there, and I have some of you dear saints who write me and tell me how unloving I am and how I don't care about them dying and all that sort of stuff. Well, I don't know. They had that in the paper, a list, the pictures of people who were stolen by COVID. Mothers, fathers, grandpas, grandmas, teachers, bus drivers, choir schools. Most of them look pretty old, but... The whole point is, we do care, but death is an inevitability. It's something that's going to happen, San Kovix or not. It's, it's going to happen. But they get people living in such fear that they're afraid to step out of their houses. They're afraid to go to the mall. And that really leads to the second thing. It creates a spirit of dependency. You have to trust in your leaders to do what they tell you, even if they contradict themselves or even if they violate your civil rights. Your duty as a good citizen is just to shut up, do as you're told, and they'll let us know when we can come out and play again. So rather arbitrarily, our government says, well, we're going to move people from level one to level two, but not Spokane County. <laughs> They've been too rebellious. I thought we had the, you know, four levels. I, I love this, the name games that they play, you know. We have four levels. You have to reach level four before you can go back to normal and only partially. And people didn't like that, so they went to two levels. You had 1A and 1B, 2A and 2B, which seems like it's still four levels. <laughs> but, you know, people look at that and go, well, yeah, we're making progress. Yeah. I took a class in college because my friend took it and he said, you're allowed to declare your own grade. And I said, that's just what I need. I got an A plus in that class. <laughs> I didn't learn a thing. I hardly even attended, but I did well. But they create a dependency where no longer can we just step back and be responsible for ourselves. If it's prudent for you to wear a mask, wear a mask. If it's prudent for you to social distance, then social distance. If it's prudent for you to, to do anything at all, then it's your choice, you do it. But to simply put a, a quarantine, and that's what it really is, upon everybody, because somebody might die. We say things, well, one person is too important to lose. Let's apply that to other things in our life, like driving. Do you realize if we wanted to drop, just slash death by, by automobile accident, all we have to do is reduce the speed limit to five miles an hour? <laughs> I mean, it would be virtually impossible to die under those conditions. But why don't we do that? Because it would destroy the economy and it's totally impractical. 
and there would be no food on the shelves of the grocery store. I mean, that's, that's the simple reality of it. So we realize that life involves a certain degree of risk, and yet what they're trying to do is saying, we have to make sure that there's no risk involved. And so if you're elderly and you're sick, the safest thing we can do is put you in a nursing home with other people who are elderly so that you can get an Emmy for being the greatest governor in the United States. I don't know where that came from, just popped in my head. The third thing is isolation. If you want to brainwash somebody, you isolate them and you control the flow of information so that the only things they get is what you give to them and you don't allow them together as families at Christmas and Thanksgiving because they can begin to sit down and look at each other and saying, isn't this stupid? I mean, when they were giving instructions for how to celebrate Thanksgiving and Christmas, I decided I was not interested in celebrating Christmas and Thanksgiving because the, that wasn't a celebration. Felt like asking, so when are my visiting hours? The fourth thing is fatigue. You emotionally wear people down. You take away their hope. You take away their initiative. They feel like there's nothing they can do to change their situation. And most importantly, if you can create a system where they're relaying, relying upon the government to keep them in, uh, uh, supported by stimuluses of various kind, first steps in what's called basic uh, guaranteed income, a universal guaranteed income, which has been tried in Finland and other places and found to be a dismal failure, but nonetheless will get you dependent upon the government so that you're relying upon them to support you into their old age, which we'll talk about again next week because part of the danger is right now, the predictions are that Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid will be bankrupt in the year 26 because we're paying these stimulus checks by borrowing from the Social Security fund and the fund is going to go bankrupt in 2026. But you just get worn down. Fifthly, there's self-criticism. That's where you're made to feel critical of yourself, like white privilege. One of my sons was telling me he was on a Zoom call with the church where he's serving, and he said, I had to lift in the 30 minutes of the associate pastor repenting of his white privilege. I mean, it's like, yeah. And if you're black and you don't feel like white privilege is real, then you're just not black enough. And so we have groups like BLM and Antifa and the whole progressive movement, which basically is constantly telling us that we're basically evil. The 1619 Project, with this fallacious historical record, uh, has been invalidated, rejected by every respectable historian in the country, and yet it's being taught in schools as the critical race theory. The basis of all the problems in America is race. And so we're supposed to start feeling bad because we don't have enough melanin. I understand why Rachel Dalzell did it now. It makes perfect sense. The sixth thing is finger pointing. Um, if you're not being self-critical enough, then you have to start being virtue signaled, social media banning, uh, trolled. <laughs> you know, there's name calling, there's cyber bullying. They're calling people, you're a Nazi, you're a racist. And they begin to throw these terms to make people want to hide and has made many of you afraid to really speak your mind in any kind of public setting because you know suddenly people will turn on you. Then the seventh thing is what they call baritrous abuse. And that's a fancy word for the barrister, which is a lawyer, who will sue you to exhaustion. You sue people and you threaten them with legal action until they finally give in, which many of our major corporations have been more than willing to do. And then lastly, number eight is thought terminating cliches. What does that mean? They begin to push phrases over and over and over again so that you just accept what they're saying without really thinking about what they're saying. So we say things like critical race theory, and you say, well, what does that mean? Or you say that, well, America is systemically racist. What does that mean? What, is that really, what are you exactly saying to me when you say that to me? Are you telling me that 
Racism exists in the United States. Yes, it does. It exists in every country in the world. And I've been in countries where people have racist attitudes towards me because I'm white. And even worse, I'm an American. Yes, racism is a sin. It is part of the expression of sin in the lives of sinful people. But to say something is systemically racist is to imply that that is the basis for every decision, every motive that you make. So that the pilgrims who came, the Puritans who came to America came here because, not because they wanted freedom of worship, because they wanted to have freedom to engage in slavery. Now, now don't get confused by the fact that they didn't have any slaves with them or that most of them died the first year from disease and starvation and other things. That's, that's secondary, but basically this is the premise and therefore we need to operate on that and promote that idea. So that when we're told us that the, the globe is warming, even though all the evidence suggests just the opposite. And when people like Michael Mann are saying, would you show us the, the data that you used to come to the conclusion of the great hockey stick? He refuses to do so. When he was challenged, when he sued a, uh, another climate scientist who said it, it's false, he sued them in a Canadian court and he didn't realize that in Canada, if you sue somebody and they want your information, you have to give it up. So he subpoenaed his evidence, his facts, his data for saying that the globe is warming. And he decided to withdraw the suit rather than provide the data. Now, it's, it's one of those kind of things you say, well, if you are speaking factually, then why would you be afraid to have somebody else look at it, <laughs> examine it? But nonetheless, we're being pounded with this kind of thing. The idea that this is the worst pandemic in 100 years is, is ludicrous beyond the extreme. To call something an existential threat or to say to you, the science is settled is another way of saying, don't confuse me with the facts. I've already made up my mind. And if you do question it, then you're a science denier. And if you voted for Donald Trump, you're a Trump extremist. And on and on it goes with these labels that are put on people. Do I think there are Trump voters who are extremists? Absolutely. I think there are Biden voters that are extremists. <laughs> you open up a can of sardines, guess what you're going to find? Sardines. Yeah. But the ninth thing, and as I said, I'll get into these more next week, is to create a dynamic of national bankruptcy. Just to let you know, we're at 28 trillion in debt. We're headed towards 30 within the next year if all the spending programs that Biden wants to go into. He said he wanted to spend $4 trillion in the first year, which would put us up to about 32 trillion. Just to give you some context, when George Bush left office, we were at 10 trillion, 8 trillion, no, 8 trillion. And Barack Obama said it was a scandal. Um, so, I mean, you think about that. That's not that long ago. We've gone from 8 trillion in debt national debt, to 28, and we're headed towards 32 within the next year if they continue to go forward. There comes a point where that's unsustainable. In fact, um, <clears throat> one writer put it this way, he says, the government has the power to artificially create as many dollars as it needs to pay its debts. But this kind of hyperinflation would deprive the US dollar of any value and tank the global economy and trade with it. What would transpire if social security checks stopped showing up in the mailboxes and Medicare benefits got cut off? Well, we know that many of us would react pretty dramatically. We would be, you know, become the queen in Alice of Wonderland, off with her heads. And so that's going to bring us into a call for a new global reserve currency. So, as I often say when I come to the end of these messages, so have a good day. Uh, this is upsetting if you love America. 
This is upsetting if you love your family and your kids and your home and all those things. Those of us who have worked hard denying ourselves so we could pay off all of our debts and pay off our homes and kind of live free of that obligation suddenly see that in a moment that could all be taken away from you and belong to somebody else and you're just giving a basic income by which you can pay them to live in your own home. It's unthinkable. It's, it's bizarre. But you have to understand that We've talked about a lot. In the end times, will be perilous. will be terrible. That we as Christians need to prepare ourselves for what the future brings because you know what the positive side of hard times are? A lot of people take a new hard look at the gospel. A lot of people who don't want to hear Jesus' name mentioned suddenly are interested to talk to anybody who can give them a hope and why they're not suicidal like everybody else in the neighborhood. And you know, I just know that God never lets happen, anything happen without a purpose. But I think it's critically important that we understand that the world that we feel is gonna continue every way, is, has always had track, will one day not be that way anymore. In fact, one of the things that Peter said in his second letter in the, sec, in the third chapter, he says that before Christ comes, people are saying nothing has changed since the fathers fell asleep. We've been hearing this doom and gloom stuff since, since I was a little kid. I don't believe in any of this stuff. Nothing's ever different. Everything's the same today. And I think to myself, are you living in the same city I'm living in? It's hardly the same that even the globalists say we need a reset. But that is an opportunity for us to reset our hearts. That in some ways, maybe we need to clean our table of all of our presumptions and our self-satisfaction and our false sense of security and all the rest of it and step back and say, God, I depend upon you and you're always faithful. So that when the waves come, I won't be afraid of being drowned. When the fire comes, I won't be afraid of being burned because you know me by name. I belong to you and I'm secure in my relationship. And besides, this isn't my home. That God has created me for eternity. He saved me, he's chosen me. And that's really what I'm aiming at or I should be. Take heed, keep on the alert. For you do not know when the appointed time will come. It is like a man away on a journey who upon leaving his house and putting his slaves in charge, that'd be you and me, assigning to each one his task. Do you know what yours is? And also commanded the doorkeeper to stay alert and therefore be on the alert, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, in case he should come suddenly and find you asleep. What I say to you, I say to all, be on the alert. Notice carefully. Look out for future dangers and future threats so that when those times come that you will not be caught up in the deception that will overtake the world. Father,